Good morning. Welcome to RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse. It's my privilege to host our ongoing conversation about innovation, disruption, and how technology is changing everything around us. If you're joining us on Facebook or WebEx, welcome to the conversation. Please share your questions, as well as uh, in the audience, please share them uh, via Facebook Live. We'll get to them uh, in our conversation. Now, if you've been coming to the Disruptors series over the last couple of years, you know we usually talk about what technology is doing to the world around us. And today we're gonna do something a little different. We're gonna talk about what technology is doing to us and specifically to our brains. What are these wonderful little supercomputers doing to what's inside the supercomputer in our, uh, in our heads? And there's no better person in the world probably to, uh, to join us for this conversation than Dr. Morali Doraswamy, who's a leading research professor at Duke University, an advisor to uh, a number of companies and industry associations around the world, as well as governments around the world, and co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Neurotechnology. Morali, welcome to RBC and RBC Disruptors. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. And congratulations on being the big basketball city in the world. <laughs> Before that, Duke University yeah. had the best basketball team. So this is a humbling moment for Morali to come from Duke to Toronto exactly. and realize that there is a bigger basketball capital than, than Duke. And we, RJ Barrett, by the way, was just on loan exactly. to, uh, to you guys. We currently have the most Canadians' most favorite collegiate basketball team, so that's great. It's, a great, uh, it's been a great association. Long may, uh, long may it continue. We'd like to start these conversations with uh, some rapid fire questions. So I'm going to start those with you and put you on the spot. Morali, uh, how much time have you been on your phone already today? I probably underestimated, but about 30 minutes. I try not to look at it first thing in the morning when okay. I wake up. W what's the honest answer? Honest answer, maybe an hour. Yeah. Double. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Typical day? Typical day, six to seven hours between phone and tablet because, uh, you know, as a doctor, as a researcher, you're sort of tied to it. And what's the one thing you do or one of the things you do to uh, remove yourself from uh, digital engagement? Nature. Went for a run this morning. Uh, it's the best thing to reset your brain. Great, great. Let's start the uh, conversation with uh, one of the most important questions for all of us to come to grips with. Techno-optimists or Techno-pessimist? Definitely a techno-optimist. If we can learn more about the mysteries of the mind and the brain, and if we can master tools like artificial intelligence, I think it'll be the greatest event in our lifetimes and in history. That's a great, uh, great point to remember as we get deeper into the conversation. Let's start, though, with a bit about you. How'd you get into uh, brain science? Such a fascinating field. I've, I've always been passionate about it as a child, maybe from science fiction novels, maybe Star Trek. Um, but I uh, truly think the brain is the final frontier. It holds solutions not only just to solve human suffering and misery, you know, mental illness and neurological illnesses are the single leading cause of disability worldwide, presentism in the workplace. I know you have an amazing program on mental health. But I think it goes beyond that. I think the more we learn about the brain, uh, it has the power to transform our lives and transform society because everything we do the loves in our lives, the wars, the prejudices, inequality, a lot of it comes from brain and behavior. And the more we learn about the brain, you know, the future Alexas, the Cortanas and the series are probably going to get better. So I think it has huge potential to transform everything we do in every walk of life. So help us understand what screens generally, but phones specifically, smartphones, are doing to our brains. Just a, one, one stat to throw out there, 98% of children under the age of eight are spending two hours a day. I mean, these are little kids, brains developing, as you know, spending significant time on a, a, a phone or tablet. Should that worry us? Yes, it should. Um, as with any new technology, you know, we have to realize it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we tend to use it sort of incorrectly in the initial phase before we learn our errors and then correct the course. Uh, we don't fully understand what technology is doing to the brain, but it's definitely good and bad. Uh, of course, um, screen time is an enormous tool to educate children, uh, to bring pleasure. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there are critical periods in a child's development. And when we call critical periods, that means a child has to be exposed to vision 
for the eyesight and the brain's visual system to develop. A child has to play and be exposed to the environment and external influences for certain parts of the brain, the social skills to develop. Uh, a child has to really learn how to form deep connections with friends, with parents, for that part of the brain to develop. If all of that time is spent on screen time, then you're missing out on that stage of development. And at a very fundamental level, you're not getting physical activity that leads to obesity, other kinds of medical issues. So I think we need to understand this better. The, 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 the research is fully not uh, complete and the jury is still out. But I would, I would highly recommend limiting screen time in toddlers to perhaps under 30 minutes a day, 15, 20 minutes, and in young children, at minimum, uh, no more than one or two hours. But older children also, I think we need to really encourage them to explore the real world out there. At what, uh, what age is the brain fully developed? Uh, we thought the brain was fully developed sort of by 10, 11, but now we know there's a second phase of brain development that occurs in your teenage years. So I would say throughout until maybe 21, 22, uh, and of course, I think women mature faster than men. Uh, we, we know that. We know that. Yeah. Uh, but I, so I would say the full brain development probably doesn't occur till your early 20s. Uh, but you know, through all, throughout our life, as you point out in the video, there's neuroplasticity. Our brain is always adapting, learning, circuits are being rewired. So for all of us with teenagers in our lives, we should really be trying to control screen time best as one can with a teenager? We need a balance between screen time versus real world time. You know, the best 3D is in nature, right? Uh, the best sort of rejuvenation is in nature. When you want to reset your stress levels, you go to nature. The internet is not really a permanent solution. It's a temporary fix. And it's a sort of a, a vicious cycle. These super stimuli get you more and more hooked and as a result, you sort of need more and more. It's an endless cycle. And there's much debate in the, in, the, in the scientific community about how significant a problem this is and whether even it should be labeled a disorder. Is this, in your view, a disorder? Our use of digital yes. art technology? Well, any kind of addiction is a disorder. Um, it's not yet formally, internet addiction is not yet formally labeled as a disorder, even though in the latest psychiatric Bible called DSM-5, it is uh, internet gaming disorder is a condition that's been named as worthy of study and to keep an eye out for. Uh, it has all of the signs of a classic addiction. You know, people need the fix first thing in the morning. They get distressed when you take away your cell phone from uh, somebody for a day or two. Um, people really get hooked on the super stimuli and then you get tolerance and you want bigger and bigger and bigger stimuli. And so, uh, uh, and it takes people away from their work. It reduces their focus, reduces their attention span, reduces their relationships. So clearly I think it has all the makings of a disorder. And I think it affects about eight to 10% at the most serious level. The estimate is about eight to 10% of North is American North population America? may have quote unquote internet uh, gaming disorder and addiction disorder. How much of a, is that growing or is that plateaued? We don't have a formal set of criteria yet, so it's hard to measure how much it's growing. Um, I expect that it's going to continue growing. Uh, I, I don't see any reason why it would plateau because there's an explosion of apps, explosion of uh, the smartphones are getting better and we're getting hooked in more and more and more and they're very good at exploiting our psychological weaknesses. You know, every sort of notification you get is like an instant cocaine hit. And you see that in, 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 in your you brain studies. And you see that in brain studies. Yeah. Now, and, and a key element of this is social media. Uh, and there's lots of technol digital technology beyond social media. But as we showed in the video, social media is leading to lots of FOMO concerns. Um, curious, in your, wor your psychiatric work, what kind of behavioral changes you're starting to detect, especially among younger people, because of social media? Sure. I mean, you know, when I teach a class, no one's looking at the professor, everyone's looking at their screen. Uh, so that's the first thing you see, your attention span has gone down. Uh, people want a really quick fix. Uh, there are different kinds of memory that scientists talk about. One kind of memory is called semantic memory, which is sort of your deep ingrained knowledge of facts and content, like what's the capital of a city or you know, a capital of a world, uh, a country. Uh, those are facts that we all grew up with, but now, people are focusing more on a different kind of memory called procedural memory, which is where to find the information rather than having to physically store it uh, in your brain. 
So we're shifting uh, in that direction. It's also changing other behaviors, uh, how we interact with people. Uh, it's also changing our sleep patterns, our circadian rhythms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I think there's enormous uh, degree of change and, and some would argue it's perhaps even affecting our mental health. So it's, it's, it's good you touch on mental health and let's get to that in a moment, but I wanna keep you on the point of memory. As you study brains, how do you see the human memory changing because, because of, uh, best as you can tell, technology? Well, the, the best analogy is mathematics. You know, if I give you two six-digit numbers, how many people here can multiply two six-digit numbers in their head? People used to be able to do this before the calculator. Uh, there used to be various uh, techniques and mnemonic techniques and mathematic techniques. Now, any calculation, even sort of calculating the tip, the bill automatically prints what's the tip you're supposed to pay, and we've forgotten what 10% or 15% is, and we will soon. Uh, so that's where we're going to be headed with memory. So I think we are uh, going to rely more and more on Google and our smartphones for everything, for phone numbers, for addresses, for zip codes, uh, and for facts. We, we won't know the capital of any country very soon. That's my prediction. And if the phone gives you fake news, you won't have a way to say is that real news or fake news. But I guess that leads to one of the question, or one question from that is, uh, why does that matter? Because I can, from my phone, find out the capital. Sure. That's just a simple search uh, function, and the phone has become maybe an extension of my brain, and I can use my brain for other things. Yes, I, I agree. And uh, some would say, look at calculators. Calculator on net has given us great benefit. All of the worries about the calculator were misplaced. All of the worries about light bulbs, so many inventions um, have been misplaced, and I think you're probably right. We, we hold on to sort of old values like handwriting. How many people handwrite, you know? Uh, <laughs> in the old, I see a few write handwrite, but cards, occasionally birthday cards, and if you have client cards or whatever. You should ask how many people handwrite that other people can read. That's, I, 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 I no would, doctor yeah. can, and no, doctors never could anyway. Um, but uh, it's like that skill, and it may well become a vestigial skill, and there may be a few artists out there who are sort of mnemonists who go around circuses and perform that will say, like, wow, we didn't know humans had this capability. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, w w one of the great early functions of the brain was navigation. That's how we survived. You, you left the cave, and you had to know how to get back to the cave, and right. the brain was wired right. to help you do that. GPS takes care of that for us. Uh, and makes it much easier to navigate, uh, right. especially through traffic. Uh, but what does that do to our brain? Well, these are the kinds of questions that have not been studied. In fact, uh, the Nobel Prize in medicine was won a couple of years ago for discovering a type of cell in the hippocampus called the grid cells that are like the GPS in our brain. And um, had the internet, you know, uh, uh, been available 25, 30 years ago, that research would not have been possible uh, because most people would not be using that cell. And I think, but the beauty of neuroplasticity is our brain can rewire itself and the real estate is so valuable that those cells will eventually probably evolve or rewire to do something else. It's, and I'll give you a, a somewhat cruel example. Uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, scientists did an experiment where they closed the eyes shut in some laboratory animals so that at, right at birth, so that the part of the brain that receives stimulation from that part of the visual cortex uh, did not receive any uh, input from the eye. But that part of the brain then rewired itself to get auditory stimuli and other kinds of stimuli. And that may be, we may become super good at procedural memory we may be super good at typing or with voice recognition devices. So we, we're gonna evolve new brain capabilities that match what the technology uh, serves us. So let's come back to this point about aug augmentation, uh, one might call it, and, and how the relationship between technology and the brain will evolve. But, but I wanna get back to a point you raised about mental health. Uh, the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry had a, a, a report out uh, earlier this week or last week saying that the number of Canadian uh, youth, I think it was, had between 2009 and 2017 who had been uh, admitted to emergency departments in this province of Ontario had doubled. Okay. So we're seeing a, kind of a, an explosion of youth uh, being admitted to emergency departments. For addiction? This is for self-injury. 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 Maybe speculative, but I'm curious of how closely you would associate that with, uh, with our reliance on digital technology? So uh, suicide rates 
first of all, have been one of the toughest problems to crack in all of mental health. Um, teenage, and teenage suicide and suicide in, amongst the young college students is either the number one or number two killer in many countries around the world. I think technology is good and bad in that, in that sense. And let me tell you the good side. We're now developing artificial intelligence algorithms to try to see if we can predict suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation. For example, you know, there are many copycat suicidal things that are posted on social media, on Facebook, on uh, uh, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, and people post self-injurious thoughts. And many of these companies have realized that they owe a social responsibility to develop algorithms to try to identify when someone might be at risk for injuring themselves. And they have set up, for example, Facebook has an entire team to deal with this, and they've set up a systematic process uh, to handle these kinds of things. But I think the real way to do this is not for tech companies to each have their own algorithms, for there to be a public-private partnership where these tech companies come together, work with academic thought leaders, with patient communities, with uh, advocacy groups, and come up with a not black box, but a transparent algorithm so that it puts that person's well-being uh, you know, at first, rather than just Facebook's interest first or Twitter's interest first or whatever. So that's one. So there's a potential benefit. I think on the flip side, yes, too much technology addiction can lead to cyberbullying. You have self-esteem issues. Um, you know, uh, people post something really negative about you. It can really spread fast, and the effects can be exaggerated dramatically. Whereas in the old days, you know, if somebody said something negative to you, it would just stay between the two of you. Here, the whole world sees it. So, I think it can magnify some of those negative effects that can lead, lead impulsive teens to do reckless acts. So, I think that's the downside. So, the the answer is probably both. But curious if you think we need to look more to technology to solve the problem of technology, or more to humans and human behavior? Well, I think we need to look to human behavior first. We need to provide them a secure, safe environment where, you know, in the first place, I would say 80, 90 percent of suicidal acts can probably be prevented if there was a secure, safe social support system in place. Um, but I think technology can be used, but I'm not suggesting people do more screen time to, you know, prevent uh, suicides. Uh, but I think social media companies owe a huge uh, uh, duty to society because that's where all the teens are spending their time and that's where the signals are there. So when you talk about the need for a, a, a greater social support system, given the reality that we all live on our phones, how can we better go about developing that? I think the first is the realization that um, the friends you have on social networks are not really your deep social friends there. You know, some of them probably are, but the vast majority are not. So I think what I tell people is every day, try to have at least one deep, meaningful conversation with one person that's close to you. Yes, you can post, you know, hundreds of things on social media, but every day if you can do this, go for a walk with someone you really deeply care about. You know, spend time with a family member you really care about. That, I think, is the counterbalance that's lacking. That's probably the best advice we can take away today. Just have a walk and talk every day. You're welcome. That's great. No, thank you for that. <laughs> a, a great question here from, from uh, WebEx. And please share questions. This is a wonderful conversation. Uh, looking at childhood development, what's more important, technical skills or human skills, social skills? Or? Well, if artificial intelligence and robotics evolves, uh, as I think it's going to evolve, then I think the uniquely human skills are what are going to become very important. If you look at the jobs that are going to be automated, uh, as, and I'm not saying this just to serve myself, a psychiatrist and a mental therapist job is probably very unlikely to be replaced compared to somebody who is doing routine sort of mechanical kinds of work. So anything that requires empathy, deep understanding of individual human personality traits, anything that builds engagement, um, I would trust, I think those kinds of skill sets are going to be valued a lot. Of course, the high level cognitive skills are always going to be valued, right? In Silicon Valley, there's a saying, only two kinds of people, those who are programmed and those who write the programs, right? So <laughs> if you can be the one writing the programs and creating the artificial intelligence codes and the, and the sort of the framework, then of course, your job will never be replaced. So another challenge that some technologists are talking more about is called computer vision syndrome. I wonder if you can talk to us a bit about that. So, First of all, explaining what it, what sure. it means. 
how many people know carpal tunnel syndrome, mm -hmm. right? In the old days, you sit on your keyboards and you type and you develop wrist pain, whatever. So computer vision syndrome, I think in some ways, crudely speaking, is an analogy where you're staring at your screens for a long period of time, often at suboptimal postures. Uh, it can lead to eye strain, can lead to headaches, it can lead to dizziness, uh, it can lead to a variety of uh, other uh, symptoms. Uh, and I don't think it's any one specific disease. I think it's a constellation of uh, conditions. There's a, a, a simple way to sort of uh, uh, fix it. It's called the 20-20-20 rule. How many people have heard that? I see a few hands uh, going up. So every 20 minutes or so, you take a break. I don't know if your job will allow it, but hopefully it does. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, take a break uh, for uh, 20 seconds or so. Uh, go out, uh, do other things, and keep a distance between you and the screen you know, of at least 20 inches or more. Don't stare too close. But ultimately, I think it's getting away from screen time. Minimize screen time as much as you can. Tell us a bit about uh, what you're seeing in terms of sleep disruption, another yep. issue of, of, of concern. And this is also tied in with the computer vision because one of, well, obviously the biggest cause for sleep disruption is the barrage of information that comes in, um, the barrage of emails that come in and everything feels urgent. But also the fact that we keep our phones so close to us, right? Uh, how many people go to bed with their phones under their pillow Nobody's going to admit it. Um, if we had a lie detector, we would know, okay. How many people check their phones one minute before going to sleep? How many people check their phones the first thing after they wake up, before they brush their teeth or have coffee? See? Of course, many of you may have very important jobs that require you to do that. Uh, and, and, and the bank is grateful. Uh, but uh, so there's many issues. One is if you look at your phone just before you go to bed, you may think you've shut the phone down, but your brain is not shut. Your brain is still processing the last few messages and emails you've checked for 15, 20 minutes, maybe even longer. So that's one. Uh, and then the second thing is, of course, uh, the, the phone may be emitting different kinds of lights. And people have heard of blue light, right? So blue light from various types of screens, and of course, LEDs as well. Um, so blue light is really good for working during the daytime. It enhances your uh, alertness, your concentration, your mood. It, that's why I'm wearing a blue jacket. Um, <laughs> but blue light at night is perhaps not as good. And we now know our brain has a specific pathway that's not just for image formation. It has a specific pathway for circadian rhythms, it has a specific pathway for mood, for other kinds of things. And blue light goes directly into certain parts of the brain and interferes with your circadian clock and also may interfere with your retina. Too much exposure to blue light at night may be harmful for the retina. Again, this is early days. The research is not fully conclusive. But there are suggestions that people exposed to blue light at night, they have doubled the impairment of their circadian rhythm as people say exposed to sort of softer hues and less blue hues. So you have filters on your phone. Uh, you can wear, of put your phone far, that's my recommendation, right? Before you go to bed, take your phone to another room, tuck it away, tuck it away goodnight and say goodnight to your phone. <laughs> Don't pick it up till like one hour after you wake up. How, how much time before uh, you go to sleep do, do you try to I try to turn it off away? at least an hour an before, hour? Uh, but it's obviously it's very hard because a lot of us can only do work late at night, et cetera. And, and so try at least to give yourself an hour if possible. Great. Uh, we've talked a lot about the challenges, and I, I want to turn the conversation to some of the solutions and opportunities, both with technology and human behavior. And let me start with a quote from Scientific American, which I, I, I find uh, incredibly powerful. It says, we are, simply mer we are simply merging the self with something greater, forming a transactive partnership, not just with other humans, but with an information source more powerful than any the world has ever seen. And that's extraordinary. This is transforming us right. as, a, as, as a species. So as we get deeper into augmented technology, how do you see the brain evolving? What are the opportunities? You talked, for instance, about the empty space that we can now take advantage of. But what, what do we need to start to think about in the, uh, the years ahead for this augmented future? It's definitely the future. And I think uh, the possibilities are endless. Uh, if you think about uh, where we are already currently, there are cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are a technology to enhance hearing in people who have serious uh, 
uh, hearing loss, and it's an implanted technology, and it sends signals into the brain. We now have retinal telescopes, that a telescope that can be implanted into your retina that magnifies your vision for people who have had retinal damage. So we're already there. We already have brain-machine interfaces that can make paralyzed people type just with their minds, without being able to use their fingers because their arms may be paralyzed. We now have mind-controlled drones that can be flown. So we are heading, so some of the world's greatest technologists, I mean, Elon Musk, for example, has Neuralink, uh, where he's planning to embed a mesh in your brain so that you can directly access the power of the internet without typing anything directly from your brain in real time, and ultimately maybe create an internet of brains, a collective sort of consciousness, if you will. So, Obviously, there are other kinds of issues. There's privacy issues, there's ethics issues, inequality issues. Uh, there's a variety of issues that we have not solved. The power is great. We need to put in place a proper framework to make sure we harness this technology correctly. The immediate applications will be in mental health and neurological disorders. If you look at mental health, um, there's a big diagnosis gap, there's a big treatment gap. It's a massive shortage of counselors, therapists, and psychiatrists. In some countries, it's a 50-fold shortage. So digital tools, if applied in the right way, can scale access to counselors. There are chatbots, maybe uh, uh, technologies that are wearables, uh, et cetera. And neurological diseases like Parkinson's, we can already implant a pacemaker in the brain to correct tremors. We have closed-loop implanted devices in the brain that can detect when a seizure focus is going to happen, an epileptic focus, and automatically send a signal to, to prevent that seizure focus from happening. These are approved devices that are already on the market. So that's the future. I think first we need to really make sure we do good clinical trials, use them to help people with serious neurological and mental health diseases, and then sort of roll them out to enhance normal human abilities. Enhance older people's abilities to lift heavy objects maybe enhance memories in patients with Alzheimer's disease, and then apply it to sort of general intelligence. You mentioned the need for a framework. I'm curious what kind of framework we need because those, uh, those priorities uh, are, 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 are wonderful and, and important, but I can imagine market forces being what they are, yeah. steering science to uh, help those who are more advantaged, who have the resources to, to improve their own brains, not for medical or mental yeah. health reasons, but just for, for individual gain. Yes, we have to guard against that? it. Uh, and we have to guard against it sooner rather than later because if we don't set the right framework and policy now, they're going to be abused. A lot of technologies have been abused. So how, how do you do that? I mean, if I have a million bucks I, and can buy a better brain, that might be a good, a good I investment. I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's who we elect as politicians. It's the groundswell from the audience. And really, uh, with a lot of these technologies, sometimes We've had massive abuses first before we have taken corrective course. Hopefully, we won't go there with artificial intelligence and brain-enhancing technologies. You, you, you mentioned at the beginning your, your childhood love of, uh, of science fiction. I think you were an Asimov uh, yep. fan. I'm curious how much of this is science fiction, or how close are we to having supercomputers in our heads? Well, we uh, already have implanted computers like the pacemakers I told you. Mm -hmm. We already have chips that have been implanted for patients who are paralyzed. So the research is accelerating. Uh, in mouse models, they've developed an artificial hippocampus. The hippocampus is the seat of some of our memories, and that's the area that's damaged in people with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, people are experimenting with uh, uh, transplanting memories from one animal to another. Uh, and they're already there. Um, there are projects underway to reverse engineer the brain, to try to understand how the millions and millions of nerve cells work in parallel processing, and then try to sort of build models to simulate that. Once we get to that point, then of course, you know, we'll be able to think about uh, replacing specific parts of the brain that are damaged. But we are far away, and. Uh, I don't think we're anywhere close to sort of understanding general human intelligence. Should we already be changing the way we learn? Well, we've learned passively. We definitely should be changing it to more active learning and active experiential learning, which is uh, 
not just, and I don't mean to just this conference, not just sitting and listening passively. Um, <laughs> because uh, studies have shown that what you heard in the first five minutes is forgotten by, what you, by the time the end of the lecture comes around. So you need rehearsal. You need active experiential learning. You need group discussions. You need people to study a topic beforehand. Like you should have told people, read about rewiring the brain come before you come beforehand. Mm -hmm. And then we have an interactive discussion. And of course, the, in, the internet uh, technology is going to completely change how we learn everything. There are brain stimulation techniques that are now uh, uh, being tested in Canada and elsewhere where you can stimulate certain parts of the brain and it enhances your concentration, enhances your ability to recall, and enhances your ability to learn stuff. Is that what we're all going to be using? Going to be wearing a little cap while we're reading for our exams and then instead of like one hour and five minutes we learn everything? Maybe. Uh, we're not there yet, but that's the direction I think we're headed. Great question here from the audience about, uh, about some of the challenges that are very much part of our lives today with all the new discoveries and research that uh, you're talking about. Very exciting. But why are we still so challenged in, in uh, solving problems like Alzheimer's? Not problems, diseases. Well, we, that, I started by saying the brain is the uh, sort of the final frontier. Um, we don't understand enough of the brain. Um, you know, a pioneer in Canada, neurosurgeon Dr. Penfield, uh, you know, about 50, 60 years ago, mapped specific regions of the brain, maybe 30, 40 regions, and showed what they do. We're now at maybe 200 regions in the brain where we understand, but you know, the brain is like space, right? It has billions of uh, connections. We don't understand anything. In fact, there's a very famous uh, saying, if the brain were so simple that we could understand it, then we would be so simple that we could not understand it. So it's a very philosophical question. <laughs> Will humans ever be able to understand their own brains? Mm. And, uh, and I think w we shouldn't stop and trying. How do you answer that question? But I think the more progress we can make, the closer we're going to get to be able to solve diseases like Alzheimer's. And we understand a lot about Alzheimer's. We're not there yet. That's why we've had so many failures. But there's still at least about 100 different drugs in trials. How close do you think we are? I think we already know lifestyle factors that influence the risk for Alzheimer's. So we can already influence those lifestyle factors, and about 30-40% of the Alzheimer's risk is lifestyle. We already know the genes that cause familial Alzheimer's disease, so there are gene therapies that are in development to address those. We know the plaques and tangles that build up in the brain, and we, can now, we have scans that can now visualize the buildup of those plaques and tangles. What we don't know is what are they doing in the brain and how can we prevent that buildup? And that's what science is working on right now. Just quickly, what are some of the lifestyle uh, factors that people can address so, uh, with respect to, to Alzheimer's? Sure, of course. Uh, keeping your brains uh, engaged uh, is uh, one. Being socially active is the other. Heart healthy lifestyle. Uh, there's some controversy. I think some people believe that diets that are rich in saturated fats are bad for the brain. And a Mediterranean-style diet is very good for the brain and may reduce your risk for Alzheimer's. Are you convinced of that? Uh, well, I follow a vegetarian diet, so for the most part, so uh, vegetarians have a low risk of Alzheimer's. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have nothing to worry. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned gene therapy, which raises a fascinating ethical challenge because lots of exciting uh, prospects are emerging, and those cost money. Yes. And those may be available only to a very small percentage of humans who have the financial means for that, uh, for that therapy. How should we navigate those ethical choices? We already are facing those with cancer drugs and a number of drugs now. Um, the newer, number of newer drugs cost as much as half a million dollars a year. So, uh, uh, so it's a choice right now that we're facing in, in free market countries. If you don't have the money, you die. If you have the money, you get this life-saving drug. I don't think we can have it that way. Uh, in Canada, I think the government will decide whether the drug offers value or not. But with gene therapies and with other newer treatments, I think the costs could run into the millions, um, especially free market forces dictated. And I think uh, we need to come up with innovative solutions. Maybe a bank like RBC can design a program uh, to help people with life-saving illnesses by some kind of a policy um, that allows them to buy these drugs. But in the future, where we are headed, when you're born, you're going to have your whole genome sequenced. And they're going to tell you, you have the risk for 25 diseases, and here's the odds at which you'll develop these diseases by this age. And you'll already be able to calculate how much money you're going to need 
to take care of those diseases. And some bank will come up with some policy. They'll say, this is the policy I'm offering you, or you have the choice of keeping your genetic information private and not letting anyone know. So these are the dilemmas we're going to face. And with gene therapy, there's lots of other dilemmas. Which genes do you allow people to knock out and which genes do you allow people to enhance? You know, is this going to worsen inequalities? Uh, so, so there's uh, huge, huge conundrums that we haven't addressed. This could be the ultimate disruption of society. I mean, it's going to throw things upside down if you are told at an early age that uh, you are fated yeah. for the following medical outcomes and you do or do not have the yeah. economic means to address those. What is that going to do to our communities? It's a science fiction coming true. Uh, I think it's going to be very divisive. It's going to be, um, it could worsen suicides, for example, if there's not a good solution, because you don't want to tell people they have a bad outcome without giving them a, a happy uh, solution for it. So nobody has the right answers. Uh, I, I don't think as a society we have thought through that far enough. That's why a lot of scientists are urging we need to really put a framework around how AI is used, how genomic data is used, privacy, you know, um, and creating sort of a framework so that inequalities are not worsened. And, you know, ultimately we have to put human beings first, not like big governments or companies. And I, no disrespect, to mm. me, I'm in a big company, but. Uh, yeah, but I also wonder if that's gonna take us back to a way that civilization has often been where people were consigned to fates, yeah. whether it was through a caste system or other sort Correct. of social strata. Yes. You knew you could not move beyond your st the stratum into which you, you were very born. Very well could. But we've, uh, modernism is all about the idea of progress. Yes, that you are very not well it could. And um, we already had the eugenics movement, uh, you know, in the early part of uh, the century. So it could very well lead there. Uh, and, and, but I think there's a much more important question, which is how much diversity should we preserve in societies? I'm not talking about diseases. We are all different human beings. We have different personalities. And, and, and that diversity is what leads to new inventions, new creative ideas, new artists. Some become a CEO, some become a musician, and some become an amazing moderator. Uh, so <laughs> with gene therapy, if everyone's the same, will we lose a future Buddha or a Dalai Lama or uh, you know, a famous Canadian basketball player? <laughs> Great, uh, great uh, debating point. Let's turn to um, some of uh, some some questions about uh, wellness tools. Uh, and I want to get your thoughts on how much time we should spend contemplating, thinking. One of the challenges with the d devices, but even just our lifestyle, is that we're all busy. From yep. the moment we wake up and look at our our phone, to that's the last thing we look at. There's rarely enough minutes in between where we just contemplate. Yep. Some people meditate, but just think. What is that? doing to our brains? So I think contemplation is very important. It's, um, we um, grossly um, underestimate the importance of contemplation and we're doing less and less with the internet and other kinds of superficial stuff. <laughs> In the ancient Indian way of life, it was suggested that you spend the last 25 years of your life contemplating. Because through contemplation is where you discover the biggest solutions to society, the deep solutions, not the superficial solutions, the deep solutions to things like injustice, what brings you happiness, uh, you know, things like that. Um, meditation helps. So I think as a start, I would say minimum 20 minutes a day, everyone should meditate and be contemplative, preferably in an outdoor setting, and preferably in a quiet setting, not with hip hop music playing <laughs> in your headphones even though Drake is amazing. Um, <laughs> why, why outdoors? Why outdoors? Why outdoors? Because nature um, brings you a sense of tranquility and it also gives you a sense of the expanse so that you can wonder. And, it, and the biggest solutions lie in nature and the biggest mysteries are in nature. Mm. Um, so, and then I would say, um, if you are not a good meditator, Anything that puts you in that sort of trance-like state would be good. If you're a runner, that's fine. Just go on a solo run, if possible, without like loud music, and, and let your brain think. But walking is amazing. So in the brain, there is a network called the default mode network. It's called default mode because it's active when you're not doing anything. It's, it's almost like when your brain is idle, that network is active. And that network is what causes you to daydream, 
It's what causes you to come up with creative solutions. Let's say you can't find a solution to something and you set it aside and boom, all of a sudden your brain comes up with that solution. That's the default mode network that's working in the background and it's come up. So you need to give time for that network to do its job. It will do the job. So and, and meditation, contemplation, that's when this network is active. And does meditation or contemplation actually rewire your, your brain, or yes. does it just allow you to access parts of your brain that are Both. otherwise dormant? Both. Um, so studies have shown that uh, short-term meditation obviously accesses different kinds of networks, but long-term meditators have structurally different brains than short-term meditators. In fact, there are studies that have shown that you can apply an artificial intelligence program of people, long-term meditators who have had brain scans versus novices, and the AI program can f identify who's an expert meditator versus who's not an expert meditator based on the size and shape. Studies have shown that long-term meditators have less age-related shrinkage in certain parts of the brain, especially the hippocampus and other areas. Long-term meditators, there are certain parts of the brain that are related to judgment and morality. For example, if you're given a scenario that says, you know, should I push this person off the bridge or not? the parts of the brain that are involved in that morality judgments are influenced by uh, meditation. And more important, I think meditation brings out a sense of collective, the importance of collective well-being rather than individual well-being. So there's a study we use in psychology where we show a photograph. There is one happy person in the middle smiling. There's a bunch of unhappy faces around. And we ask people to rate the happiness of the person in the middle. And a lot of people, especially Western societies, and ag again, I'm, not, I'm, I'm overly generalizing, uh, tend to focus on the person in the middle and rate that person as very happy, whereas people who do yoga, meditation, a lot of contemplative activities tend to take the whole picture into account and rate that person as less happy based on the unhappiness of the background. And so to transform society, I think, uh, you know, the Dalai Lama said if we taught all our children meditation in two generations, we won't have any war. Mm. You, you, you've partly answered this question, but I wonder, it's, it's from WebEx, if you could speak to it directly about whether neuroplasticity persists through our lifetime or does it occur primarily during developmental years? Uh, it's both. Uh, primarily, it occurs during developmental years. Uh, it does persist uh, later on. It's a little harder to tap into, but you can always retrain the brain even later in life. And there may be new ways with technology and with genetic engineering that we're able to sort of tap into that neuroplasticity that children have. And that's one of the major areas of research. So when you're talking about meditation, I was thinking about uh, the, the great range array of uh, meditation apps yep. and devices that are now available. Any good? Well, if you're, uh, it, it, you know, it's like everything else. If, if you're struggling to get into meditation practices, you want discipline, you want something to nudge you into that, then I think the apps are great, uh, you know. But I, long term, ultimately, I think you need to free your, I personally think, like I said, the less distractions, the better. Go out in nature and learn how to you know, de be deeply contemplated without any of these variables. So we've got only about uh, five minutes left. I wonder if you could share more insights as to what we should all be thinking literally about doing uh, for uh, the rest of the day, but in, in the weeks going forward. Uh -huh. what, what, what's some of the best advice you can give our audience on how we should all live think, behave, to improve the wiring of our, uh, of our brains? I mean, I think you should think about what makes you truly happy. Uh, maybe spend 10% of your day at least, because I know 80, 90% of your day, you have to do what your job involves. Uh, but at least try to spend 10% of your day on something that truly brings you happiness, it's truly meaningful, you know, be grateful to others. Uh, that really enhances uh, the well-being of others. Uh, I think ultimately, when we do something for someone else, that's what brings us happiness and meaning in life. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, the, what's the ultimate goal of technology? What's the ultimate goal of the bank, you know, to bring happiness and well-being to everybody, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's really what we should focus on. Now, there's also a lot of technology out there to help us achieve that uh, happiness some of it not uh, so good. Right. How can we best filter the, uh, the good from the bad technology? Whether it's apps or devices we might put on our, uh, our heads that uh, right. reach into our brains. Well, again, like I said, technology is a tool. Some people need the tool, um, and that's fine. Um, if you can use the tool to learn some habits and practices, 
and take objective measurement of what you're doing right versus not doing right, then that's, that's great. Uh, technology can also be a tool to measure global happiness. You know, technology by itself is not going to bring you happiness, right? Because then you're setting up a cycle of, I always want the newer phone, the newer phone, the newer phone, more apps, more apps, you know? So that's not, a, so it's a source of sort of want and desire, not deep happiness. But now with technology, we can actually measure the collective happiness of the world. So we actually published a blog where on Twitter, if you download Twitter feeds from across the world, just by analyzing the word content, you can actually now begin to get an index of global happiness. So we've traditionally used indices like GDP, which are imperfect measures like GDP. You know, it's an economic forecast of how different countries are doing. But now you can actually truly get a measure through social media of global happiness. And, uh, and I think that's going to be a valuable public tool for economists and doctors and others to use. And who's, who's happiest in the world? Well, everyone's happiness fluctuates. Yeah, I'm sure if I looked at Toronto like the day you guys won the <laughs> basketball game, you were the happiest country. It was happy town. Exactly. Yeah. So it, 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 it fluctuates. I wonder if we can just as we uh, st start to wrap up uh, an amazing conversation, if, if I can get some final thoughts from you around AI which we spend a lot of time talking about in, uh, in the bank and certainly uh, uh, across the country. And wondering where you think AI is taking us uh, and, and taking our, our brains. Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, you know, Toronto, uh, Jeff Hinton and his group are some of the uh, leaders of modern, the modern AI revolution, if you will. I think it's a two-way street. Um, AI has enormous potential to help uh, neurological and mental health uh, disorders. And likewise, the more we learn about the brain, the better AI that we can develop. I think I started out by saying that, you know, Siri and Alexa and all of these are great, but the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn about empathy, the more we learn about trust, the more we learn about where in the brain does love reside, where in the brain does depression reside, I think Alexa and Siri and all of these are going to be better and better and better at helping us truly achieve what we want to achieve. Um, there's already now an AI-based avatar called Ellie that people can talk to. It's a human-like therapist, but non-judgmental, listens exactly like a therapist would. And studies are already showing that people are more willing to reveal confidential and embarrassing details to Ellie than they may be to a judgmental therapist. So if AI is designed well, it has enormous potential to help us in the narrow field of medicine. But, you know, of course, AI is going to revolutionize every aspect of how we live, breathe, and work. And so uh, it, they may be an AI moderator. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Maybe there should be, but that uh, is, would be a, 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 a yeah, great, great point. Great point for a uh, for a future conversation. Well, just around AI, AI and the, uh, the the brain, we could go on for hours. This has been such a fascinating, fascinating conversation. Uh, usually, with our guests, or we we make a charitable donation in recognition of uh, the time they spent with us. And uh, Morali has asked us to make a donation to the uh, Baycrest Foundation. I wonder if you could say a few words as to what Baycrest means sure. to you. Uh, how many people have heard of Baycrest? It's a, it's a leading geriatric uh, health system uh, down the street here in Toronto. Uh, Baycrest is uh, home to a major neuroscience center called the Rotman Research Institute. They're also home to something called CABHI, C-A-B-H-I, which is the Canadian Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. So this is a public-private partnership that is like an incubator fund. It's a solutions accelerator that has funded over a hundred innovative solutions to people all across Canada. A nurse from a nursing home can write to them and say, I have this amazing solution to take care of an elderly person with bed sores. They will evaluate that proposal and give some funding and also help the person make that proposal come true. So that's what uh, CABI does and the Baycrest Foundation is the foundation affiliated with Baycrest that raises money to support all these causes, especially brain health of all Canadians. They're a leading center, so thank you for that. No, thank, thank you. So, Morali, this has been uh, an extraordinary conversation. I want to thank everyone in our audience for spending time with us, those of you on WebEx and Facebook. Thanks for being part of the conversation. 
Please mark your calendars for our next disruptors. It's uh, Wednesday, July 17th, when uh, Sharzad Rafati of uh, Broadband TV, which is an incredible Vancouver company, uh, Sharzad will be here talking about her journey from Iran to uh, Canada and this, uh, this uh, amazing enterprise that she's uh, building. Then in August, we'll have our special uh, youth disruptors for summer students at uh, RBC talking about next gen uh, entrepreneurs and uh, keep uh, September in mind when we will have our 50th edition of RBC Disruptors and a very special guest uh, joining us for that. So details to, to come on that. Uh, if you want to hear this conversation uh, in a different format, we'll have a podcast on SoundCloud and on other uh, platforms out in the next short while. Follow us on social media as well as on RBC Connect uh, and stay in the conversation. Morali, thank you so much for all you're doing uh, for the world, for our brains, and for thank spending you. time with us here this morning. Thank you. It's a great honor and pleasure. Thank you.